diversity, unity and community. I, I think it's evident with the artists that are here, there's different skill sets, different backgrounds, different ethnicity. The Art and Funk Festival. That it's more important to, to pay for your bills than to let the next generation pay for them. Tackling those challenges head on, not ignoring the realities of the fiscal challenges we face in the state, but instead saying it's the government that's failing us. And the 2010 election, next on Black Nouveau. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Milton Dockery. And I'm Faith Collis. We're glad you could join us. On this edition, we'll talk about the upcoming election and its impact on the African American community. We'll visit the Art and Funk Festival and chat with the authors of Why Do I Have to Think Like a Man? But first, the issue of teen pregnancy. By all indicators, teen pregnancy is a major factor in poverty and other social issues. And Milwaukee's rate is among the nation's highest. What better way to talk to teens about teen pregnancy than for the message to come from a teen? Liddy Collins introduces us to an author whose book of poetry examines being a mommy young. If I knew that laying down with you would end up this way, I would have waited. Now I'm waiting in the lobby of the hospital with my other. I wish that you were here with me. Why did you say you were not the father? You were my first and said I would be your last. Now at school, you got my name in your mouth and another girl in your arms. Well, I told him I thought I was prego, and he said it was going to be okay. When I was for sure, he became furious. He blamed me for the whole thing and then stopped talking to me. And it's so shocking how you could have so many memories with somebody and they say will always be there, but it's all lies. I am still in so much pain, but I have to move forward in life because I have a little one depending on me. These words are from a little book entitled, Being a Mommy Young by Rihanna Madden. She wrote this while attending St. Joan and Tita High School in Milwaukee. Her older sister becoming pregnant at 15 prompted this book. It was a lot of controversy in the house during that time, and I really didn't know, you know, what to think. So it just really woke me up to a lot of things to know that my niece could have been aborted, that a beautiful baby could have been aborted, and that, you know, my sister really had to step up to the plate and become a mother, and it took a family to raise my niece. It took all of us. I felt it was necessary to write this type of book because in our community, there's a lot of teen pregnancy going around, and I just feel that if someone is not going to speak out about it, or if adults are going to keep speaking out about it, why not a teen speak out about it and let other teens know that, you know, yeah, you know, some people think like the media portrays a lot to us. Uh, we look at the media for a lot of things. So, you know, sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative. So I just felt that it was my duty to be a positive media portray and actually tell the kids around my age and younger that it's not okay. I come from a strict Christian family, and when I told my parents I wanted an abortion, they told me no. I had to keep the baby. When I told my boyfriend, he accused me of being a slut and sleeping around. I had my baby girl in May of 2009, and I love her more than anything. But giving in just that one time ruined my entire life. I have nothing. I wanted to move to California and pursue my music career, but I can't do that anymore because I have a child. The theme running through my book is basically letting teen mothers know that even though, you know, pregnancy may come into your life, that it's not the end. You don't have to stop going to school. You don't have to stop, you know, doing your everyday activities. You can, you know, still make it with the baby, but it's also portraying the message that you can wait for sex, that teens should wait for sex. In researching the book, Rihanna gathered knowledge about teens and sex, which she shared during presentations at school and during talk sessions at the Boys and Girls Club. And they all wanted to hear what I had to say, and they were actually willing to sit down and listen to me. And I told them it's a lot of emotions that come with it. It's a lot of, you know, baggage. And right now, everyone needs to be focused on school and bettering themselves. And then before you can think to take care of another life, you have to be able to take care of yours first. Her book reflects the shock of getting pregnant so young and the aftermath of becoming a mother. They didn't know that it was going to be this hard or sometimes they didn't know 
that um, it was going to come about. A lot of them didn't know that having sex for the first time, you can get pregnant. A lot of them was very, they had no knowledge of, you know, as far as like STDs or knowing about pregnancy or knowing what it is to raise a child. No one ever talked to them about that. I know you're pregnant and you don't have anyone to talk to. It's not the end. The father's not around and has left you sad and blue. It's not the end. As the days grow longer, you become stronger and you realize you can make it. For information on being a mommy young, go to L-A-K-E-T-T-A-C at boysgirlsclubs.org. I'm running for governor because I love this state and I believe in Wisconsin. But I believe the governor we have right now is taking us down the wrong path and it's about time we stand up and take our government back. You know, as I mentioned, I grew up in a small town and now I live in the largest county in the state. And I gotta tell you, big or small or anywhere in between, there's no place in the world better. I'm running for go governor for three simple reasons. One, to fight for jobs in the state. Two, to put Madison and the state government on a diet. And three, to provide some adult supervision in the state capitol. My roots in Wisconsin run deep. My mother was born in Sturgeon Bay, moved to Green Bay, and then went to school in Madison. Next week's election, we'll see either the mayor of the city of Milwaukee or the executive for the county of Milwaukee becoming governor. What does that mean for the state and residents of the area? We'll pose that and other election-related questions to our guests, independent journalists Jacqueline Heath and James Causey from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Welcome to Black Nouveau. Thanks, Mel. Thank you. The race for the governor. The race has candidates with different visions of the government. Which vision do you think is best for the black agenda? Miss Heath. <laughs> well, um, I think personally, and you know, as a black journalist, you know, all of the above, um, the agenda that gets jobs back in people's lives. Um, I don't, you know, it can be black, white, whatever, but black unemployment in this state has been extremely uh, augmented and pronounced. Um, black males, especially. Um, statistics allude to the fact that in Milwaukee County, uh, if not the state of Wisconsin, but seeing that this is the concentration of where most African Americans live in southeastern Wisconsin, um, the black unemployment rate of, among black males is 50 percent or more. Actually it's 53 percent. Regardless of education level, work experience level, or what have you. Now you have to ask yourself, why is that? So, you know, a lot of things can impact that. Transportation issues, jobs aren't in the inner city okay. anymore. If you don't have a car or a driver's license, you can't hop, you know, the monorail gotcha. to Waukesha or whatever, you're out of it. Mr. Cozy, how do you see these two visions in terms of the black agenda? Well, well you know, uh, that's a very good point, but there's also the issue of poverty, also the issue of education. Who's going to address the black male dropout rate in, in NPS? Which so, so between the two parties, between the two candidates, do you see one with a specific agenda that will address both of the concerns that you guys are mentioning? Well, um, if, if you think about the issues of jobs, they're both talking about jobs. Mm -hmm but who has a better vision okay. as to solving those problems? Well, it depends on what do you hear. Um, as far as uh, uh, taking on the issue of education, I think uh, Barrett did go out on a limb when he tried to challenge the, uh, the status quo of NPS, okay. and he needs to get some credit for that instead okay. of being slapped around for it. I think that was, uh, that was visionary on his part. Um, I don't think it transcended throughout the black community like it needed to. And that's unfortunate because we know that you can't solve the problems with unemployment and poverty until you address the issues of education, and it starts with MPS. Not only that, um, speaking of Mayor Barrett, people may not know this or forget about it, but for at least five to seven years that I know of, Mayor Barrett, even when he was in Congress, fought for something called the Job Corps Center Definitely. here Definitely. in Milwaukee. Yeah. And it's now a reality on the Northwest side. Okay. Um, that in and of itself, now I'm not, you know, as I said, I'm not endorsing Definitely. anyone in particular, but just looking at the monumental effort that it took, first of all, to have Milwaukee named a, a Job Corps site. For the sake of time, I didn't mm -hmm. mean to cut you off. But, but you know, that, that speaks to 
job training, job remediation, Definitely. education, certifications, Definitely. and getting people independent and employable. Gotcha. Now, to the both of you, do you think the black voter turnout will be large? Well, if I have anything to do with it, it will. <laughs> I will be doing drive-bys okay. and roll-ups if I have to, to get more people to the polls, make sure that people are registered to vote. They early vote or they make it on election day. Regardless of who wins, mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be a few political positions open. Do you think the black politicians are positioning themselves for the county exec position or the possible mayor position? Briefly, either one of you? I don't know. You don't know? I, I, I really don't see anybody, I think people are uh, taking a wait back and see approach, but I think it would be a frenzy after November 2nd. Let's look at the Senate race here in the state. Uh, the race seems to have tightened up. Why? Maybe people are listening more and thinking more. Okay. I mean, we've got a new um, term in the lexicon, creative destruction. Mm. Think about that one. Would you define that though? <laughs> Maybe the person who invented it should. <laughs> to me, it's an oxymoron and a non-term that describes something that doesn't benefit anyone. Switch and focus a little bit. On the national scene, there seems to be a lot of anger. That anger is being directed at both Democrats and Republicans. Is this true for African Americans in terms of displaying that anger? I think it's more not anger as much as it is frustration. You know, the buzzword now is waiting for mm. Superman. A lot of people I know felt a very strong, uh, you know, long-awaited high when President Obama was elected and inaugurated. I mean, the ancestors rose from the grave, so to say. But what he inherited and what he has been called upon to do to turn things around, it's not going to happen on a dime. And I think a lot of people that supported him are maybe a little impatient, a little, um, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting things to change, they're wanting to see change, but change is exceedingly slow in okay. coming I, I, I would say that people are angry. Uh, I think Mr. Cosby, can I get you to address this for me? I mean to cut you off. Go ahead. What do you think is driving that anger? The fact that you don't have a job, the fact that you can't pay your bills, the fact that your children need stuff provided for them and you can't provide for them. That makes you angry. You're Frustra losing your house. You know, the fact that, you, yeah, you're losing your house. And, and, and every single time you fill out a job application, you know, you get reject letters. That's, mm. that's more than frustration. That's anger. And mm -hmm. something needs to be done. Briefly, let's talk about voter suppression. Do you think that will be occurring not only in Wisconsin but at the national level? When I say voter suppression, I'm talking specifically African Americans. I think it has been attempted and it's in force right now. You see billboards, particularly in the black community, mm -hmm. in the inner city, talking about felons being, you know, not able to vote, and if you do, you'll make a U-turn back to gotcha. jail if you, you know, if you have, if you've been there already. Mr. Posey, that very, in itself. Excuse me, you know. I'm sorry for that. Mr. Posey, very briefly, how do we motivate, how do we motivate African Americans to get out. To we, vote. we, you know, there was a um, Washington Post uh, piece uh, this week that basically said that you know there's going to be a huge turnout. They're expecting a huge turnout, and that 80 percent of uh, you know black voters or potential voters uh, feel enthusiastic this time and, and are willing to go out and vote. Basically, you have to exercise your okay. right. If you don't exercise your right to vote, then you will be all left right. out. Do the homework, right. cast your vote, okay. make up your own all mind, right. and do it. All right, thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks. Recently, the Marcus Center was host to the first Arts and Funk Festival. Our Bobby Drake attended the event. On a balmy autumn day, Milwaukee and the surrounding area's urban artists set up to show off a wide range of their works. An urban art festival. I mean, something where it doesn't matter your background or your skill set, but we meet in the center of the city. Diversity. I mean, not as a buzzword. Uh, unity and community, not as a buzzword. But I think it's evident with the artists that are here, there's different skill sets. 
different backgrounds, different ethnicity. A layer of wax over that, and it becomes about seven layers. Oh, that's good. Nice. That's what these things too? Yeah, these are actually, the images you see in the background here are traditional photographs I took. But people kept buying them, and so I kept making them. And if I went back to Hayward with anything that was not real fishing lures, I would never hear the end of it. They'd kick me out of town. Yeah. And then you've clearly got people who are heavily, heavily experienced, uh, have an extensive exhibition record nationally, and so the people who are learning can learn from the other people that are more experienced. We used with taking spoons, <laughs> which is really grounded in craft. I mean, we invented spoons, you know, like, you know, metal spoons invented spoons. But where are most of these artists from? Uh, most of them are from here, but we do have some from Chicago. Uh, we do have some from Madison. We've got some from Bur Burlington. Um, so I, I, I think it's a, it's, a good, it's a good mix. In that mix, Brad wanted to make sure that the artists participating were acknowledged in a best of show competition. Back when it was raining this morning, he was ready to pack up and go. Look what you would have missed out on. Now what this is, man, is a, uh, an honorable mention award. You have a $50 gift certificate for Strathmore products of Strathmore paper, all right? Which is one of our supporting uh, in-kind sponsors, all right? Let's give it up for Fred. Reginald Baylor is a professional artist and one of the judges. I would say I've been an artist my, uh, ever since my youth. What would you say is the breadth of artistry that you see today? Well, um, there are uh, emerging artists here, um, artists have been around and uh, very successful and have all full-time careers. And uh, I, I think that's refreshing when you hear because you're seeing a, a, a wide array of uh, different genres, uh, different talents. Um, different medias. It's, uh, it's a good, it's a good exhibition. Definitely more difficult to judge, because uh, a lot of times uh, rewarding an artist for what they do um, in the emerging stage, uh, it's, it's good. It's good for the soul. It wants to help them continue, but then you can't um, say, well, just because that person's a professional, they shouldn't be considered the best because they've already already arrived. Uh, you don't you don't think about who the artist is. Okay. You don't um, try to pay attention to where they are in their career. You only judge the artwork that's been submitted. You look at the art all on its own. All right. First place award. This guy's pretty dynamite. He's got a very impressive setup. Um, I'm gonna just set it up like this. Just a, a, a studio partner and good friend. And uh, he's definitely uh, the torch bearer, if not the blowtorch bearer. We got Mr. Uh, Michael Nolte. Come on down, first place, baby. Here you go, Michael. Thank you, sir. You came in first in the competition. How's it feel? I was really surprised. That's fantastic. Your work is extremely interesting. I think your work is phenomenal. But could you explain exactly what you do and how you get to these creations? Sure. Well, I think of it as transformation. Okay, very transformative in nature. My goal is to have the original tool and the bug that it is transformed into visible at exactly the same time. So if you can see them both, then I've done my job properly. I use no paint except what might be on the original uh, found object. Right. I only use a chemical coloration. What's the largest bug that you've made? Well, I did a six-foot-long, four-foot-high walking stick for Rogers Memorial Hospital. Wow. What's the small? A tiny little spoon beetle. I just took a, a vacation spoon, and I welded legs onto it and eyes and gave it a nice color. It's just a tiny little bug. In the past, Milwaukee's been a very art-conscious but art-selective kind of city. And right now, there's so much talent budding from unconventional places you can only not acknowledge it for so long. So that's another reason for this festival. Where other artists have been unacknowledged in other venues, they're gonna get some acknowledgement here. Comedian Steve Harvey's book, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, was released in January of 2009 and went to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. The book's aim was to help women understand what men really think about love, relationships, intimacy, and commitment. 
It generated hours of discussion and commentary over the airwaves in many homes and many other places. And in a new book, Why Do I Have to Think Like a Man? Women respond and voice their own concerns. It was written by former NFL wife Shanae Hall and her mother, Rhonda Frost. Ladies, welcome to Black New Row. Thank you very much for Thank having you. us. Shanae, is this a direct, is your book a direct response to Steve Harvey's book? It is a direct response to Steve Harvey's book, but there's also so much more than just a response. There's a lot of uh, interviews. We did over 300 interviews to get this book to where it is. Um, there's a lot of stories and life experiences as well to help women understand we don't have to think like a man. We could think like a lady and still do all right in the dating world. Rhonda, tell us something about what's in the book that speaks specifically to us thinking like women, that we don't have to think like a man. Well, so, uh, since I don't have that experience of thinking like a man. Um, it's going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. Um, th the stories that we talk about, the dating experiences that we have, they're, they're, they're every woman's story. So um, uh, everyone who's picked up the book has been able to say, hey, I see myself in that story. And these are women thinking like women, acting like women doing the stuff that we do. We've all had an experience of something that you've written about Absolutely. in the book. Absolutely. How was it to write together, mom and daughter, um, intergenerational? How, how did that work? I think it was phenomenal. Um, it was so liberating and it was so fun and I've never laughed so much. Shanae's funny anyway, <laughs> but we spent a year and a half, um, you know there was some emotional stuff because we're both revealing very real stories that happened to both of us and emotional things but um, it was fun we had a good time and we also learned a lot about each other. Shanae what was that like for you having to reveal some of the personal experiences in the book with your mom writing with her? Um, it was you know I didn't think about it you know because again we're writing separate then I'd send it to her and she'd write and then she emails there was a lot of emailing back and forth it wasn't until it started getting into the later chapters where we're talking about understanding your baggage and understanding the things that we I've been in those shoes and she was reading those things for the first time that I'd be laying there taking taking a nap and she'd call me and say, Shanae, oh my God, this happened to you? Or oh my God, that happened to you? Because when I was writing, I was in my own space, you know, and I was, a thing that's great about this book is I literally poured my heart out almost like a journal. So when my mom picked it up and she was like, how come you never told me? How come did it? So it sparked a lot of conversation that we had never had before because there's, I'm a very private person. You wouldn't know it from reading this book. But like I said, I wrote it as if I was writing a journal and I was just talking about all the things that I needed to get off my chest and how I got from point A to point B. So it was, it was it's kind of strange at times. <laughs> how do you think your book differs from other relationship books? Um, I think ours differs in a lot of ways. One, because like I said, we did 300 interviews of men just asking repetitive questions, asking new questions, getting ideas of how men really think and saying, do, we, do I want to think like him? Um, and then we took it a step further and we actually exposed a lot of stories and a lot of things. And of course, being an NFL wife, there are certain things that people don't see on a day-to-day -day basis. They just see the highlight and the glory and the house and the hill and the kids and the dog, and they don't see what all that goes on behind closed doors. So all of that is exposed in the book. So I think that makes it a lot different than any other book, because it's not a tell-all book. It's a tell-what-I-learned book. Rhonda, how do you want this book to help other women? I want them to, f to, to know that what your past is doesn't have to be your future. I want them to know that it's it's okay that you've been through that experience and that you can come out on the other side. I want them to know that, that we can date better, we can date smarter, that we can avoid heartbreak if we follow certain rules, that we can get through this thing and um, be elevated as a result of that. As a mom, is that advice for daughters or for women across the board? It's for women across the board. Of course, it's for our daughters, too. And some of the women at some of the book signings we've had uh, have bought three or four copies, and they're saying, I'm passing this on to my daughters so that they can learn now. Um, but I've had an aunt. My aunt read the book um, within two days, and she's 79. And she, she called saying the same thing, oh, my God, I see myself in this. And if only I'd had something like this years ago. But even her, she could relate to the same stuff that everyone else is relating to. So I think it's phenomenal because of that. 
And is it a book that you would advise mothers to read with their daughters and maybe share information back and forth? I mean, it seems to, did it bring you all closer? It did. Absolutely, it did. And what's funny that it's funny that you bring that up because I have um, there was a lady who bought the book out of Sacramento, and she she bought five more books after she read her copy for younger girls that she mentors, and some she said even a woman over forty, and she's going to have a roundtable group at her home, and she wants to sit around and talk to each person about what they gained from the book, and she just feels like everyone uh, of all the age groups can you know, can, can be inspired by it and can change. So we were obviously touched by that too. So the book was therapeutic, therapeutic for both of absolutely. you. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Thank you ladies very much for joining us. Thank you for having us. us. So what did you think about the book? I think it was a great beginning to another conversation between men and women about men and women and relationships and how important it is for us to listen to one another and respect those thoughts. I think it's great because it teaches women how men think, thus better preparing them for relationships. See, and the responsibility is on us again. I knew you would say that. Oh, Faith. And that wraps up this edition of Black New Hope. Remember in the coming week, do something to expand your world. Good night. Good night and thanks for watching.